Um, first, can you introduce yourself and give a little bit of background about yourself? Okay. Um, my name is Bob Zagosta. I've lived in the Omaha area, uh, born here in 1954, so I'm getting up there in years, but uh, was lucky enough to live through uh, some of the great times playing. I've, I've been playing in a band since I was 12 years old. Play, they started in a polka band, uh, have a polka band still, and that band is uh, the remnants of the band that I started uh, when I, was, that I started playing in when I was 12. So. Uh, Married and have a couple of kids, got five grandkids, and uh, work here at Westside Schools as Chief Financial Officer. But I do a lot of playing. Music is kind of my biggest hobby. Uh, besides my polka band, I also play in a big jazz band on Monday nights at the Ozone, and uh, also in a Dixieland band, and then in a, a rock band with horns. So. Okay. And next question. Can you tell me about your family's history with polka? My family's history with polka starts with my grandparents, uh, particularly on my mom's side. Uh, my mom was from a little town called Duncan, which is nine miles west of Columbus. And uh, her father, my grandfather, played clarinet, violin, piano, and was uh, in a band that played for Polish weddings out in that area. And uh, my mom played accordion and piano, and her brother, my Uncle Jack, uh, also played clarinet and had a band in Kansas City for a long time. And my other aunts and uncles also played accordion and or piano too. Uh, back in the days when my mom grew up, of course that was in the pre-TV days, but uh, you know that's what they did for entertainment. They did, everybody played and um, when, uh, when they had any kind of family function at all, if you played, you were expected to play. That was just kind of one of the rules of the family. So, uh, for anything, like we'd, we'd go, we'd, my mom and dad would take us out to Duncan to see our grandparents. And, and uh, after, after grandma would fix, you know, a late lunch uh, in the afternoon, you know, we'd either, if, if it was in the weather was fine, we'd be outside sitting at the picnic table playing and the neighbors would come over and it just, that's how it was back then because it, that's what people did when they played, as, when the family did, everybody just played. And so for every family function, uh, it was always somebody playing. Okay. And what is polka to you? Mm. Well, it's, besides being music, it's just kind of more, more a heritage thing, you know, I mean, it's just, um, it's a lot different. When I grew up, it was a lot different because, you know, you didn't have access to lots of different music like you do nowadays. I, I was probably seven or eight years old before I actually knew that there were any, that there was another kind of music besides polka music because that's all that ever got played at the house, uh, you know, at our house. So, um, I mean, that's, I, that's my earliest memories of, of hearing anything. It was always polka music, so. And now I'll ask you questions about your background and family. So first question is, how did your family get to Omaha? Okay, so uh, on my dad's side, my grandparents, uh, his parents, uh, I'm sorry, that we've been my great-grandparents, but they came over, uh, his parents came over to the U.S., I believe it was like 1916 or 17 due to World War I. Uh, on my mom's side, um, the, that family arrived in the U.S. in the 1860s, uh, and that would have been her, that would have been my great-great-grandfather. Uh, so that whole area of, of around Duncan and Columbus, uh, when all those Polish people came, they came in the 1860s and 70s. Thank you. Um, what was it like growing up in South Omaha? Hmm. Well, growing up in South Omaha, it was, it was really nice because it seemed like everybody knew everybody. Uh, you know, it was every, every little part of South Omaha had its own ethnic community. And that's, you know, if, I don't know if any of you are Catholic, but if you, and it's not quite so much that way anymore, but, but back, you know, 50 years ago, every parish in South Omaha had its own ethnic makeup. So St. Stan's was, was a Polish parish. Uh, St. Peter and Paul was a Croatian parish. 
St. Mary's on 36th and Q was an Irish parish. St. Francis was a Polish parish. ICC was a Polish parish. Assumption was Czech. Uh, Our Lady Guadalupe was uh, Hispanic. But every parish had was was there because they had uh, their own ethnic makeup, and that was part of the community. Was you know a church? Uh, for example, when my dad went to St. Stan's, uh, they taught and they still taught in Polish when he was uh, as late as sixth grade. It wasn't until he was in seventh grade that they actually changed over and actually taught class in English. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, so every. Every parish had its own ethnic group, so, uh, and you didn't really know a lot of people from other parts of town. You just kind of knew all the kids you went to school with and those kinds of families. Not, it's, I mean, it's kind of, that part is kind of kind of the same, but uh, you, just, you just knew everybody who lived in your area very, very well. And do you think South Omaha has changed over the years? Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, it, the spirit of South Omaha hasn't changed. It just the, well, the, well, the main thing that's changed is with et, which ethnic groups are there. So, like South Omaha is mostly Hispanic now, and and yes, it's changed. But what the Hispanic people are enjoying in South Omaha are, are exactly the same things that the Polish and Czech people and German people enjoyed, you know, 60, 70 years ago. It's their town, their part of town. It's their, <clears throat> it's a place where their culture and their way of life. Uh, can be shared with their neighbors and friends. And, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, moan the loss of, you know, that South Omaha. But to me, it's not, it's just a different generation of people. It's still the same feel, you know, it's just a different group of people. Okay. And w when growing up, was Polka a big thing in your community? Oh, yes, very much so. Because one of the things you have to remember, and I know it's hard for you guys to, to visualize this, but you know, I lived, I lived through the time that disc jockeys came into being because when I started playing uh, when I was 12 years old, uh, there were no disc jockeys. So you hired a live band for everything because there was no choice. So if you had, you know, a wedding party or even some birthday parties or any kind of a party, you always hired, you had to hire a band because disc jockeys weren't around yet. So for any kind of family function at all, you know, we played. Uh, there were things called the day after the wedding parties uh, for Polish people. Uh, the Polish word is popularvini, and uh, literally means the day after the wedding party. And so we would play, we would play uh, weddings, we would play popularvinis, we would play birthday parties, we would play picnics. Uh, a lot of organizations had big picnics and, and would hire a band to play because there was no such thing as disc jockeys back then. So, yeah, polka was a big thing growing up. Can you explain what a polka is? Sure. Polka uh, originated in Europe. Uh, most people credit the, the uh, Czechoslovakian people for, for inventing the dance step. Uh, but polka is a 2-4 uh, beat, which means it has just a real steady beat like that, you know. And it's, there's a lot of different varieties. There's Polish style, which is the kind I play. Uh, there's the Czech style, which is more of an umpa kind of sound. Germans have their own style. Slovenian people have their own style. So, but it, yeah, it's enjoyed by a lot of different ethnic groups. Okay. And who or what inspired you to start your polka journey? Uh, well, I, uh, actually uh, going to, uh, to start my polka journey was uh, at going to visit my grandparents in Duncan. Uh, like I said, because every time we had some kind of family event, uh, you know, they played. And so I started on piano lessons when I was four and a half, and then when I was uh, eight years old, I started clarinet lessons, and that was kind of the beginning of the polka journey because that meant I got to play with my grandfather and my mom when we went out to my grandparents' house. Okay. And can you tell us about some of the venue, venues polka was played at in Omaha, and what are some of your favorite stories? Okay. The venues in Omaha, uh, there, were, there were a couple main ones. Uh, the, the building that is now uh, El Museo Latino used to be called the Polish Home. And the Polish Home is simply a, uh, a Polish cultural organization, uh, but that building had 
you know, it's shaped in a U, and on, on the, the tips of each U, there was a south hall and a north hall, and in the middle was a retail bar, and then, uh, so they would have tons of wedding receptions there. That's a place we played quite a bit for weddings and for dances. The other place that was a really uh, very popular wedding place uh, in South Omaha was Immaculate Conception Church's Hall, which is their gym, basically, but uh, it would not be unusual. Okay, so back in the old days when, uh, in the pre-disc jockey days, when we were a wedding band, it would not be unusual for us to play 60 or 65 jobs a year, which means you were playing at least once every weekend, sometimes two nights on a weekend. And I would say that uh, back in those days, uh, between ICC and Polish Home, probably uh, were three jobs a month at one of those two places. Uh, if you had uh, the really nice big weddings were at the Livestock Exchange building. Uh, they had two ballrooms on the very top floor, a, north, a, a large ballroom and a smaller ballroom. And we played a bunch of weddings up there. That was really an interesting uh, place to play too because it was a really pretty fancy ballroom for those days. Uh, looking out over the city on the 11th floor of that building. Uh, a couple other parish halls uh, that, uh, that we played at was uh, St. Agnes was a real popular hall in South Omaha. Played a lot of weddings there. South Omaha, <clears throat> excuse me, South Omaha Soka Hall uh, and Soka Hall on 13th and Martha were, were two other places that, that hosted lots and lots and lots of events. And when you were young, was what was the polka scene like in Omaha? Were there different types of polka? Oh yes, there. Omaha actually has a lot of Czech people, um, a fair amount of Polish people, less Germans, uh, uh, and, and so the band, the polka bands that were around, there were probably four or five Polish polka bands, and probably eight or ten. Czech style bands at that time, uh, some larger, smaller, some played in bars, some only played weddings. Um, but yeah, there were a lot, lot more bands around. There's not very many bands left today. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's only, there's only two Polish bands left. Uh, there's really about two Czech bands left and then one uh, trio that, that's kind of a German uh, Czech kind of sound uh, trio that plays, but that's about it. Five bands, and they're probably back in the day, there were, like I said, maybe 15. So it's gone down quite a bit. And can you tell me about some of the festivals you played in? Okay, the festivals, um, there, well, there's, there's for, for me, there are two main ones. Uh, the parish that I grew up in, which is St. Stan's Church, on 41st and J has had a Polish festival uh, as part of their parish fundraiser. Uh, we've played at that festival since uh, 1985, uh, but that festival had gone on for probably 15 years before that time. So it probably started in the early 70s. That's one that's still going on. We still play that one every year. Uh, the other one was when Peony Park was still around. Uh, there was there was a guy who had a radio show, a polka radio show in Omaha by the name of Big Joe Sedlick. And he started this polka festival in Columbus because that's where he was from. And when it outgrew Columbus, he moved it to Peony Park. And uh, so he would have, this would be on basically Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And he would have like 60 polka bands uh, on those four days. And it was always the second weekend in September. And it was here for probably, probably 15, 18 years. And it would draw people from all over the US. And it was a really big festival. To, and and he, he basically rented the entire Peony Park. So you had music in the actual ballroom, you had music outside at the Royal Grove and at the lodge. So he had the entire Peony Park rented for this festival and it was one of the bigger ones. Most, most every South Omaha church has some kind of a festival where they had music. I know Assumption had uh, their festival for years. Holy Ghost has had festival with polka bands. Um, we still play a couple, like I said, St. Stan's. St. Joan of Arc Sausage Fest is another one that uh, we played when that got started back in the 70s. Then they got away from polka music, and now the last couple of years we've been playing at it again. 
So just about every South Omaha parish has some kind of festival with music. And what are your like best and worst memories at playing festivals? Well, I, th I think the only worst, the only bad memories of playing festivals is that they're all in the summer, so it's really hot. <laughs> like, like for example, St. Stan's is always the third Sunday of August. Uh, Holy Ghost is usually the the first weekend in June, so by the middle of August, it's pretty darn hot. And uh, you know, we're playing like at five o'clock in the afternoon. They usually have four bands, so spread across the time from noon to eight, and so it's pretty hot. Uh, best memories, uh, St. Stan's has probably 3,000 people attend and the, you just can't beat playing for a crowd that size. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge rush to play for a ton of people like that. And, and the other thing about St. Stan's, it's like South Omaha homecoming. You know, I see people I went to grade school with, I see people I went to high school with. It's still a chance for that whole community to kind of come together, whether you've moved away or not. Uh, you always come back for St. Stan's Festival. So you see lots of lots of people you know. And what is the relationship to polka and dancing? Are there traditional outfits you would wear? Um, there are some traditional polka uh, or Polish outfits and Czech outfits too. We don't, we don't as musicians uh, usually wear specific garb. Um, we, our whole philosophy has been to try to not really distinguish ourselves through dress. We want, we want polka music to appeal to people uh, for the music itself and not necessarily for the dress, but there are lots of people who still wear more of the traditional dress and things. Our band just never has. And is there, is there a relationship to polka and dancing? Oh yes, yeah. The, I mean, that's, the, the dancing was kind of hand in hand with the music. Uh, I mean, yes, people, you know, listen to polka music, but I mean, the whole idea of it was, you know, was for dancing. And where are all the places polka is played? Nowadays, polka is not very many places. Uh, like I said, the, the, a lot of South Omaha church festivals are still around that, that have polka music. Uh, the Polish home, when the Polish home sold their building on 25th and L to El Museo Latino, uh, they move to Papillion and they have a hall in Papillion and they have dances about every month uh, that have some band or other play at them. Uh, we play at, at, the, okay, at the Huber House, which is, uh, which is part of the Crescent Moon. Uh, they have a, it's a German beer hall, but they have a couple of festivals. They have, actually have a polka band that plays there every month and we play there twice a year. The German American Society out on 120th uh, which was originally down on 10th Street, not too far from Rosenblatt Stadium. When they moved out west back in the uh, early 70s, uh, you know, they have functions at their hall. We play for their Oktoberfest every year, for example. Um, there's more and more places. Oktoberfests have really made a big, uh, big uh, gain here in the last couple of years. We probably play more Oktoberfests uh, we half a dozen of them now where, you know, five years ago we didn't play any. But we play, there's places like, we played the Benson Oktoberfest last year, it was the first one that they had. We played out on the street, uh, uh, not too far from the waiting room. Um, we play at the Alamo Drafthouse Cinema out on uh, 126th and Giles for their Oktoberfest. Crescent Ski Lodge has an Oktoberfest that we play for. So all these places are now starting to have at least some Oktoberfest things where you know, they have polka music, so it's finding a few more places here and there. Okay. And aside from the, the bands you played in, what were some of the other polka bands around at the time? Okay, so the band that I, so for bands that have been around, well, the band that I started with was called Lenny Rich. Um, Lenny's band, I think I mentioned the guy who had the radio show, Big Joe Sedlick. Lenny was Big Joe's brother, so Lenny had a band for a long time, and uh, like I said, the remnants of that band is what has become my band, which is Bobby Z and Polka, jo Polka Joy. Uh, one of the other main polka bands uh, that were around from that time is a band called the Polonaires. Uh, there was a band called the Polka Tears. Uh, lots of Czech bands. Uh, there was Eddie Janik Orchestra, uh, Jim Havorka Orchestra, Frankie Rimar's band. Um, Jim Botnicek had a band for a long time. 
Um, there was uh, a couple, uh, Barry Boyce uh, is still playing. He, he used to play for Jim Botnichick's band, started his own band uh, after he left Jim's band. Uh, there was a band called Little Willie who, uh, who played mostly uh, kind of Ser Serbian and Croatian music. Uh, the Serbian Hall at 50th and Harrison uh, has kind of gone back to their roots. Uh, they have Serbian bands every once in a while. The Croatian Cultural Society is on uh, South 36th Street. They have uh, some small groups play Croatian music once in a while. So uh, that's some of the groups that have been around over the years. Okay. And describe what it was like hosting the Bobby Z. Polgoyarvi show. Okay, so I had the radio, I had a radio show. Okay, so Big Joe, the guy I was talking about, had a radio show uh, here in town. He lived in Columbus. He did, a, he did a polka show on the radio out there. He had a polka show here. It was on KRCB uh, AM radio. The studios were in Council Bluffs. So in the wintertime, if it snowed and Joe couldn't get here from Council Bluffs on Sunday morning, he would call Lenny and me and we would take our records and we'd go over to the radio station and actually do the show live from the studios in Council Bluffs in the wintertime if he couldn't get in uh, or if his tapes didn't arrive because sometimes he taped a show and, and they just did the tapes. So after doing that a couple of times, I decided I really liked doing a radio show. So uh, there was a, a polka show on at the time. This radio station has been renamed a bunch of times. At the time, it was called KOOO. <coughs> Excuse me. But I went and talked to the people at KOOO, and they agreed to, they already had a polka show, so they agreed to add my polka show. And then, uh, so I had my polka show on that station uh, for a while. And then there was a radio station in Plattsmouth called KOTD, uh, which they already had their own polka show, and then they ended up uh, having my show and another guy by the name of Rudy Dvorak, who had uh, the South Omaha Polka Show. Mine was called the Bobby Z Polka Variety Show. And so overall, I had a polka show on the radio for 21 years. And most of the time, I would do my show live part of the time, but most of the time I taped it ahead of time uh, because I was usually playing on the weekends and that kind of thing, so it was really hard to make it to the radio station to do it live. Did it more so in the wintertime when I wasn't playing so much. But And that was great because, uh, you know, Besides getting lots of releases because all of these record producers and stuff want you to play their stuff so you get all these records and CDs and everything, people know who you are because they're calling you to, to request songs for people and celebrate people's birthdays and they're sending you letters so they, they get to know you. So I got to know a lot, a lot of people by doing that polka show for 21 years. Okay. And what instruments did you play? Uh, instruments that I play, I started on piano uh, when I was uh, four and a half. I took lessons for just a couple of years. Uh, switched, I, then I added clarinet, uh, only took lessons for a couple of years. Then I taught myself how to play uh, all the saxophones. And then uh, in trumpet, uh, in high school, I mean, I learned how to play trumpet. Then I learned how to play trombone. Then I picked up bass guitar. And then I learned how to sing and uh, just keep I basically play all the brass and woodwinds now uh, and just mostly self-taught. And do those instruments have a big role in polka? Some of them do, some of them don't. Uh, the, the, mostly in, in polka music you'll find trumpets, saxes, and clarinets, accordions, some kind of bass, either a bass guitar, uh, a midi bass on an accordion or a tuba, and drums. And that's kind of the essentials. Most polka bands have some mixture of those. What is your favorite polka song to play? My favorite polka song to play? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say there's a Polish song uh, with, and the other thing you have to remember is we still sing a lot of vocals in Polish. We have a lot of English songs too, but we still sing a lot of Polish vocals. And there's a song called uh, Stormy Clouds, which we do in Polish. That's one of my favorites, and most people really like it. That's kind of our big closing song, which we do, so. And can you tell me more about the accordion and its relationship to polka? Accordion, OK. And uh, well, the, the nice thing about accordion, and, and the reason that it kind of, not only in polka music, but you know, other ethnic groups use the accordion a lot, like Italian music uses a lot of accordion, French music uses a lot of accordion, and it's because it's self-contained. 
you know, it's got keys on one side, which is, you know, much like, you know, piano keys. But on the, but on the other side, you know, there's buttons. And two rows of those buttons are bass notes, and the other four rows are for actual chords. So you can get a really nice full sound with an accordion by yourself. And that was really what became uh, kind of the, the, the driver for using it in, in polka music. Uh, early polka bands did not use accordions at all. In fact, I have a picture uh, that I'll share. But uh, early Polish bands, for example, were all strings uh, maybe an occasional clarinet, but it was mostly, uh, you know, string bass, uh, a couple of violins, sometimes a piano. If the hall had a good piano, then you would have piano. Uh, older Czech bands um, would not use an accordion. They they used to use basically uh, just horn parts. Uh, we call them peck horns uh, to do the afterbeats because polka is bop, 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 so the bops would be done by horns instead of an accordion. Now, in this day and age, accordions do that work, but back, you know, long ago, before they really used accordions with polka music, horns did that or violins did that. Okay. And can you comment on the role uh, on women in polka? What role do they have? Women in polka music are relatively rare. Um, most of the women involved in polka music have been singers, accordion players, or piano players. You don't see, you only rarely, it's, it's, it's rare, but you occasionally see women that play uh, clarinet or trumpet or sax. Uh, not that common, not common enough actually, because there should have been plenty of them playing, but there just really never was. Uh, there, were, there were one or two uh, gals around that used to play violin and polka bands back in the old days. Um, but uh, you, you find some that, that still play clarinet, sax, and trumpet. But most of the, most traditionally women were, were vocalists or accordion players, some piano players, but much more rarely trumpet, clarinet, sax. Okay. And do you think polka in Omaha has changed throughout the years? And if so, in what ways? Well, polka music has changed a lot. Like, well, because when I was young, it was everywhere. You had, like I said, 15, 20 bands. Uh, you could find polka music every weekend, sometimes two nights a week, uh, just about everywhere. Uh, Soko Hall on 13th and Martha had a dance every Saturday night for years and years and years. Um, when the Polish home was at 25th and L, they had a dance every Saturday night um, for many, many years. A lot of bars in South Omaha had, had music on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, when DJs, so to give you an example of the effect that DJs had, like I said, our band, we played, we played regular dances and we played a lot of weddings. And like I said, about 60, 60, 65 jobs a year. Within three years of having DJs come out, our dance jobs, the number of times we played a year, dropped from 65 to 15. And so in the space of three years, you wiped out probably half the bands in Omaha. And now, so that's that's kind of what that's kind of what happened in the uh, later part of the '70s and the '80s when when disc jockeys really became popular. So polka music just tailed off until there was really hardly anything left. And now it seems like lately it's been like the last five or six years it's been coming back. Uh, last year we played more last year than we probably have in 15 years, mainly just because these Oktoberfests are coming back. People really enjoy the, having the camaraderie back and forth with live musicians. Uh, I think people miss that kind of excitement that a live band can generate. So it's been coming back a little bit. It's never going to go back to where, the way it was when I was young, but it's coming back some. And where would you like to see Polka in Omaha in the next 10 years? Well, it would sure be nice. Uh, it would sure be nice if uh, we had some more younger people involved. Um, so. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was 12 years old when I joined Lenny's band. Lenny's band was the youngest band in existence because Lenny's guys were probably six or seven years older than me. So they were all, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. So we were the youngest polka band in Omaha. And my guys are still one of the youngest polka bands in Omaha 50 years later, which is 
there's just nobody coming up. I mean, you can't find an accordion player at all anymore. Um, all, of the, all the places that taught accordion are all long gone. Uh, in fact, the last, uh, the last guy who used to repair them uh, closed up his shop probably six or seven years ago, and he only hung on that long because of the Hispanic people who love button accordions in their music uh, were bringing their accordions to him to get fixed. But even that could not sustain his shop, so he closed. So there are no accordion studios anymore to learn, and there's no place to get them fixed. So accordion players are really, really hard to find. Horn players, not so much. People who even understand what polka music is are even rarer, so. <laughs> okay. Today's polka is seen as a generational music. In your opinion, is this true? And if not, why do you disagree? Can you say that again? Today's polka is seen as generational music. Okay. In your opinion, is this true? If not, why do you disagree? Well, it is. Polka music is, to a certain extent, generational because older people grew up with a lot more of it. Um, but, but there's a certain group of, of younger people. Like, we get, we get people who are in their 20s and 30s now that come out to Oktoberfest. They, I, think, I think people now see, um, see the loss of their heritage as uh, something that they really need to work hard to actively seek it out in order not to lose it. And it's, it's just been a whole total change in thought about that. And I think the influx of Hispanic people in the South Omaha has kind of made people of European backgrounds realize that um, if you don't work at preserving your heritage, it's gone. Um, so for example, I can remember my grandmother. Well, the other thing about South Omaha is you lived within, you know, the family group was really close. So my grandmother lived across the street. My uncle lived next door. My uncle lived next door to him. My uncle lived next door to him. So I can remember my grandmother. Um, sorry. I can remember my grandmother telling my dad, no Polish, you're in America now. And that was a thinking back then, but what she didn't realize was that it just totally wipes out your culture forever because you can't get it back. And uh, that's why, like, uh, so there's a, there's a, a group of young uh, Hispanic kids that are in a mari mariachi band that we got to know. And I tell them all the time, I said, don't worry about, you know, don't listen to those people who tell you to sing in English. Keep your Spanish going, you know, as long as you possibly can because once you switch, you never get back. Sorry. Like my kids, um, you know, my kids like polka music fine, but, you know, it's, you know, like me, uh, we, we still celebrate some of the Christmas traditions. They know how to make pierogi. We still have the traditional Polish foods at Easter and Christmas, but their kids aren't even going to know what, what it is. Because it's just, if you don't work at preserving it, it's just gone. Sorry. And the thing about, the thing about your ethnic heritage is, which some, lots of people don't understand, is that it provides a richness to your life that you can't get anywhere else. All the traditions and, and things about, you know, setting a, at, at the Christmas table, setting an empty place for a stranger who might come in that, you know, these traditions got started in the 16 and 1700s, you know, when everybody, you know, all my ancestors lived in Poland, but that was, that was tradition and we still do that. Things like, putting straw on the, on the table to commemorate, you know, the manger. You know, just little things like that, they add such a richness to your life that if you don't preserve your heritage, um, you don't, first, you don't, people don't even know about that stuff, but if you don't practice it, it, you really have to work hard on keeping it preserved in your family and stuff, um, which is why we taught my kids, uh, we taught our kids how to make, um, you know, pierogi, and we make pierogi a couple times a year still, 
Um, my youngest daughter, Kate, knows how to make guamki, which is cabbage rolls. Uh, and, and now that I'm older, uh, you know, I try to support a lot of the ethnic organizations. For example, um, cabbage rolls in Polish is guamki. In, in Croatian, it's sarma. And so we belong to the Croatian Cultural Society. I'm not Croatian. Doesn't matter. I belong to German American Society. I'm not German. It doesn't matter. It's just to help promote that heritage uh, because there's, as the older people die off, if you don't have other people coming in, it's just gone. And all we end up becoming is, I mean, there, there's a certain attractiveness to all of us having, you know, being the same, but you lose that richness of having that ethnic heritage if you don't work on, on preserving it somehow. Can you finish the sentence for me? Polka is... Polka is. Uh, let's see, if I had to finish that sentence. Polka is uh, probably the most fun music there is out there. You never, you, ne you always feel good if you're listening or playing polkas. Tell us about your picture. Okay, so this picture. Um, Will you hold it up? So you, sure. There we go. So this picture. Um, it's another one that's going to make me start crying because um, this was my uncle Jack's wedding, and my uncle Jack. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> Back in the 80s, I, I started a band um, that it, and it was just, it was started because uh, we were playing at Polka Days and Big Joe used to do his radio show live from Polka Days and he needed a band at Polka Days to play live on the radio. So we put together, and so Joe is a good friend of mine, he says, put me a band together that can play live on the radio on Sunday morning from Polka Days. So I, this, this is an old style Polish band. You can see there's no drums, no trumpets, no accordion, no nothing. It's clarinet, string bass, a couple violins. So <clears throat> I put this band together. It was me and my mom and my Uncle Jack and, and a couple other people. So this picture is my Uncle Jack's wedding. So my Uncle Jack and my mom and I played in this band for probably 10, 12 years. It was a, it was a ton of fun. So this is my Uncle Jack's wedding reception at Tarniff Hall in Tarniff, Nebraska in uh, um, 1956, and that's me playing a harmonica in the band. And this, this person right here is my grandfather, and I don't know all the people in the picture, but this is Johnny Kozio, uh, the string bass player's name was George Starzitz. And, um, so I stood up there with my harmonica and played along with the band. And so um, the story goes, I don't remember this because I was only two and a half years old. They gave me a quarter for standing and playing with the band. And I, first thing I did was I immediately put it in the F hole on the string bass. Because, you know, thinking it was like a jukebox, you know, where you put the quarter in and you get more music out. And it took the guy like five minutes of shaking his bass side to side to get the quarter out of there. And he had to get it out because it rattled when he played his bass. So. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of, that's kind of uh, what, what an early style Polish band. And this would have been, this was from, the, at, in 56 when this picture was taken, this kind of band was almost... Dying, totally dying out. I mean, by the by the end of the fifties, this kind of band was gone. So, that's that one holds a lot of meaning to me. Um, you know, it's polka, polka music is is it's it's definitely it's definitely different over the years. You know, we've been trying to switch to English vocals and and that kind of stuff. What we find is is that if Younger people come out, learn how to dance, uh, learn, you know, at, at weddings now, they, they, they get the chicken dance. It used to be kind of the Flying Dutchman, used to be the thing. You know, if they, if they come down and participate in a couple things, you know, they find out that it's really kind of fun to do. It's, uh, 
and it's not a it's not something you're going to listen to all night. I get it, but you can come out and have a great time, uh, meet a lot of fun people. It's uh, you know. It, it crosses more cultural things now, more cultural ethnic groups than it used to because, you know, there's, you, you don't really have, back in the old days, culture, ethnic, uh, ethnic cultural groups were very territorial. You know, you went to Czech dance, you didn't go if you were Polish, you know, all, everybody there was Czech. Same thing, you went to a Polish dance, Polish band, you know, it was Polish people. Uh, German it was German people. I mean, so on and so forth. Nowadays, it doesn't matter because there's not enough of it to go around. There's not separateness anymore. People have moved out to the suburbs. There's not that community kind of thing like there used to be. So now everybody kind of comes out to everybody's kind of music, which is the way it should be all along anyway. But uh, people find out that it's when you really come and give the music a chance, it, it really can be a lot of fun. What was your question about? I was going to ask. Can you tell us a little bit more about Big Joe? Yeah. Big Joe, okay. So Big Joe Sedlik um, was, uh, like I said, from Columbus. He also, uh, so he, he had, he started out in Columbus, had a radio show at Columbus, and then he kind of expanded throughout the state. He, he had, uh, he, then he, he basically did a polka show in lots of towns around. And, and he went for bigger stuff. Like, for example, he was on KRVN in Lexington, which was a clear channel station. It, it covered almost the entire state of Nebraska. Um, he also had a syndicated radio show that he did, you know, that he shipped out to lots of uh, other cities around the country. Um, so, for example, when I was on KOTD in Plattsmouth, KOTD in Plattsmouth was also a clear channel station, but instead of east-west, it was more north-south. So you could get KOTD all the way from Sioux City all the way down to St. Joe, Missouri. And so it was quite a wide area. And I had a syndicated polka show for a while. I used to do a show in San Bernardino, California, and I would just record the show at home and just ship the tapes out. Um, but, and then Big Joe tried in the, in the uh, mid-70s, he actually had uh, a TV show, a polka TV show, locally in Omaha. Channel 7 carried it for, I think he did like a dozen shows. And then in the 90s, he started doing videos of bands. He would, he would book a hall, like Soka Hall, for example, and he would have maybe 20 bands come in, hire a video company, and they would record the bands playing, have people come in and dance, and they'd record the dancers and basically turn these into, into one-hour videos. And then when the RFD TV network, which is based in Omaha, you know, it's one of the big cable channels for rural uh, America, he worked out a deal with them and he put all these shows on the RFD network. So RFD has carried uh, polka shows, video, you know, polka shows uh, on their channel for oh, probably 10, 15 years now. And they're still on RFD uh, usually two or three nights per week. Now when Joe got out of the business, there was another gal by the name of Molly B, Molly Busta, uh, who started playing in her dad's uh, old time band up in Minnesota. She kind of produced her own polka shows and, and has been on RFD TV for a long time with her shows too, so. What was your name? Just, could you tell us a little bit more about how polka connects to the Polish heritage and why that's so important? Well, the, the, the people that came People that came to the U.S., uh, especially in this part of the country, came from poor rural areas of Poland. And so, and also from what they called mount, the mountaineer areas of Poland, uh, which were a lot of little villages, and this is the kind of music that they had back home. I have a pretty extensive collection of 78s, Polish 78s, and, and that this is what the bands were. They were a string bass, two violins, a clarinet or two, and that's what they had back home. And all that music was connected to everyday life. So for example, from my grandfather, I learned a bunch of songs that have no names, 
but for example, one we call the house to the church polka because it just doesn't have any other name. Back in the old days when they had weddings, there were no halls back in, in those little towns in Nebraska. They would go out to the farm and they'd build a platform, a wooden platform for dancing out at the, at the home of the bride. And then the, the horse and buggy would go out to get the bride from her house and the band would follow along in a horse-drawn wagon behind the bride and the wedding party from the house. And they would, they would take the, the bride from the country, out in the country on the farm, back to the church. So this particular song that he taught me was the song that they used for that trip. That's why we call it the House to the Church Polka. It has no name, but it's the traditional song that they played during that trip. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of these songs that are not written down. There's no names. There's only like two or three people left in Nebraska that know these songs, uh, of me being one of them. But that's how it's connected. I mean, that's how intertwined music was since... You know, there was barely radio, no TV, you know, live music and playing was the only entertainment that people had. And it was entwined with everything that they did. Every kind of occasion, like I said, you know, there was music there. And it was either your family or you had somebody else play. But um, I remember when, when uh, Uncle Jack would come over to my mom and dad's house or I would go to his house, it wouldn't be, hi, how are you? It'd be, did you bring your stick? because you had to play. That was it. So everything you did, everything you did was, was intertwined with the music. And there was, there was no separating culture and music. It was, they were all together. It's hard to imagine that, that a, a high school kid would want a polka band playing at their graduation party. But we played at Ashley's graduation party in, at Barry's garage. It was a huge party. It was just a riot. Her friends had a great time. They were all out there dancing, and and it was it was and that was you know, what, 12, 13 years ago now because she's 31. She would graduate when she was 18. So, so she would have a little bit different perspective on it too. But it's just every generation. It's a little less. You know, it's you just can't. It's so hard to keep, so hard to keep the heritage thing going. It's really difficult. And especially now because, you know, there are no local polka shows on the radio anymore because, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up listening to, to the polka shows on Sunday mornings on the radio. Um, and, you know, there's none left. I mean, you can get Mark Villadol, uh, a friend of mine, does a show in Columbus on KJSK from 9, nine to 1 on Sundays. And that's a, that's a pretty good, strong station. And a lot of people in Omaha can get it. Some people can't get it. Kind of depends, but you know he has a polka show. It's mostly Czech. He only he hardly plays any Polish at all, but he plays mostly Czech because that area out where he's from. Um, it's really interesting to see how the distribution of those people too, because if you go Columbus is kind of the dividing line. So if you go east to Columbus, like around Schuyler and North Bend and Ithaca and those towns, those are all Czech. In fact, they call it the Bohemian Alps because the rolling hills of farmland out there reminded people of what of the parts of Czechoslovakia they were from. When you get to Columbus and then go west to Columbus, then it's all Polish. Then you got Duncan and Silver Creek and Tarnuff and uh, Clarks and all of those areas are all Polish people. And and it's it's really weird to see you know the it's kind of. When you get past, when you pretty much get past Fremont, from there to Columbus, it's Czech, and then from west to Columbus, it's all Polish. I have a cabin in Schuyler, Nebraska. Yeah, what? We have a cabin in Oh, Schuyler. in Schuyler? Yeah. So we go to the Clarkson Czech Fest usually every year. We go to the Duck and Rib Fest, but there's no polka music. There. Yeah, they don't have polka music there anymore. <laughs> we used to play, we played a lot of street dances in Duncan back in the day. Those were always fun. It's a huge, the bird fest is huge. Yeah. Yeah, we used to do street dance uh, on the west side of the fire hall. Uh, just set up a big flatbed, put the snow fence around the whole thing, <laughs> and do it in their parking lot. Um, I think I have one more question for you. Tell, tell us a little bit about your mom, because 
we, you said that she played the accordion? Yep, she played accordion and piano. Um, her name was Harriet. And you said that was kind of rare for women? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, because she really, I mean, she played in the family band. The, the, the band I was talking about was, you know, the Polo Sausage Five and a Half is what we called it as a joke, actually. <laughs> you know, for that radio broadcast, and the, and the thing kind of caught on and caught us all by surprise. And so we ended up expanding the band and and uh, and having a piano in a band, it kind of makes the whole thing more older, older sounding kind of thing because it's just, it's just, uh, um, it's kind of, an, it was kind of the intermediate step between this band and the way polka music sounds nowadays, because there was a lot of a lot of times um, back in these halls, you didn't really have pianos much, because none of these halls were air conditioned. So these halls were hotter than blazes in the summertime and colder than hell in the wintertime. And so pianos never stayed in tune, never lasted there, just because of the extreme weather conditions inside the hall. So. When they finally got all these halls air conditioned and stuff, then they all had pianos. And then, so a lot of times you could you could do polka music in its simplest form is simply a piano bass recording with a clarinet. And so a lot of stuff kind of evolved that way. So bands started recording with more pianos, adds a fuller, richer background sound to the recording. And uh, when we added that piano on that Sunday morning broadcast with the kind of music that was, people were crazy because it sounded like the music they grew up with 40 years ago, and that was 40 years ago. So, and that's one of the reasons it caught on. And so, when we kind of expanded the band up, and and you know, to to play with a couple of family members for that long a period of time, it was it was really cool. My, you know, to have my mom and my uncle in that band, we had such a great time. We would go back. Uh, there were a lot of times we would go back and play in uh, Silver Creek or Duncan or or. Clarks and Havens uh, for dances out there with that sound and those people would just, we'd have packed the place because it sounded 40 years old. It was fun.